Hello, my name is Courtney Ora Freeman. I am your host for our Conscious Cannabis podcast. We're highlighting thought leaders in the cannabis industry and conscious business practices. This is our first introductory episode. Welcome. We will be going over some highlights and what's happening with cannabis industry news. I am a cannabis industry business consultant. I work with businesses to bring products to market, both CBD and cannabis, and that includes packaging as well as the market rollout and distribution. I'm based in Los Angeles. Much of the news that I'm sharing today will be coming from this region. LA is the sixth largest economy in the world. It's very noteworthy in regards to our industry and the impact. I will also be sharing some news from the national level and looking at the bigger picture and how news events are affecting our industry and uh, what practices are conscious in terms of uh, the impact there. So uh, we'll be going through a few notes with the news and then uh, at the end of this video, I'll tell you about our next upcoming event. So stay tuned for that. This podcast is powered by White Buffalo, which is my company. My parents started the rolling paper company in the 70s, a nationwide brand. We now have an e-commerce site, whitebuffalospirit.org. We sell um, inspired gear for the cannabis enthusiast. That includes ganja yoga gear, a line of CBD skincare products, and most recently we launched a jewelry line called Crystals and Cannabis, which is experiencing some great attention on the international marketplace. Uh, if you would like to sponsor this podcast, please do get in touch. Our website is ConsciousCannabiz.com. While this is the introductory episode, we have already pre-recorded in, uh, some amazing interviews, and those will be launching shortly on ConsciousCannabiz.com. You can follow us on Facebook. We have multiple Instagram uh, accounts. And um, you can also uh, contact me directly through our consulting site, cannaproductconsulting.com. Look forward to connecting with you more and potentially seeing you at our events. And thank you very much for watching Conscious Cannabis. All right, let's get started. So to commence our news and updates, uh, this is regarding packaging in the state of California. The Manufactured Cannabis Safety Branch is the organization under the Department of Health that regulates packaging. Last year, uh, the regulations did require that we incorporate the United, the universal symbol, excuse me, on cannabis products to indicate to consumers that the product does contain cannabis. Uh, we did need to put uh, indication there before, but now uh, we are required to incorporate additional labeling in the internal packaging. So if there's a cartridge or if there is a device that contains cannabis oil within the package, internally you'll want to indicate that on the label. You can, uh, or you can engrave it. You can also affix the label or you can print it directly to the cartridge or the device. And uh, also important um, for those of you that are trying to fit this uh, label on a small product, the uh, size was reduced from a half an inch by a half an inch to a quarter inch by a quarter of an inch. There was some confusion surrounding California child resistant packaging requirements. As of January 1st, uh, we do have more stringent child resistant packaging requirements uh, according to regulations for the state of California. Topicals, flour, and other cannabis products intended to be inhaled may utilize packaging that is child resistant only until it is first opened. That is only if the package has the statement, this package is not child resistant after opening. However, edibles, tinctures, suppositories shall be child resistant for the life of the product. And then uh, the only uh, way out of that is to have individual servings in child resistant packaging. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released a statement last year regarding the most recent vaping crisis. They said that they believe the culprit is vitamin E acetate, an additive being used in cannabis oil. And uh, the report also stated that the products were purchased at commercial entities. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it was a legal shop, but um, it was a commercial entity. And uh, Project CBD released another statement saying that potentially the culprit is synthetic cannabinoids. 
the uh, the danger of synthetic cannabinoids is that they mimic you know natural cannabinoids, and it works like a lock and a key with our receptors. If the cannabinoid that is synthetic connects it with the receptor um, because it fits, that doesn't mean that it can be released. So potentially they can become lodged, and this can cause serious health issues. Um, if you've ever heard of spice, uh, that is a, kind of a, a street term for what is cannabis plant material that has been sprayed with um, a fluid of synthetic cannabinoids. Um, it does get people high. However, it's not a cannabis high. It's extremely dangerous. So avoid it at all costs. This is big news for cannabis industry. Curlief Holdings and Cura Partners. Curleaf, uh, they made history last year with an acquisition, Curleaf Holdings, a market value $30 billion, over 44 dispensaries, operating in 12 states, according to Bloomberg, purchased Cura Partners. And Cura Partners, their main brand is Select. Uh, it was the uh, highest selling cannabis brand for uh, certainly for CBD oils on the West Coast. It's pretty big. Um, it's been sold in over 900 dispensaries. The revenue, according to Bloomberg, was estimated at 117 million in 2018. Now, um, there's some controversial concerns here, uh, especially as it pertains to conscious cannabis and conscious business practices. Um, so I just wanna highlight a few of these items. Um, last year, uh, the women in the cannabis industry were um, coming to social media and just highlighting this allegation. Nitin Khanna, the chairman and former CEO of Select, uh, had some rape allegations uh, from 2014. There was also an allegation that he accosted the hairstylist at his wedding, unsubstantiated, I don't know. They settled the case, but um, when I did look into it, I found that this statement from the company was simply, he was already stepping down. It wasn't that he's leaving because of this rape allegation. Now, um, the source that I found said nothing about their official statement. Uh, this was a PR opportunity, in my opinion, to align with women and say, we support women, we wanna make beautiful products for women, any number of things. However, uh, that was not what I found. What I found was that they simply said he was already stepping down. So uh, that for me was uh, a little bit of a turnoff, personally. Now, um, the uh, the acquisition has been plagued a bit. So uh, Cura, Can Cura Cannabis finally complete sale at sharply reduced price following layoffs that happened uh, around the holiday season of 2019. And um, now the uh, Oregon Liquor Commission, uh, they investigated uh, select products and they found that they had mislabeled the ingredients. Um, in the state of California, we are required to list our ingredients, but we don't really have regulation for the ingredients. The testing is really more about pesticides and potency, uh, cannabinoids, but not uh, really drilling down to what the different ingredients are. So there are a number of labs that are doing testing and becoming the watchdog of sorts for the industry. So thank you for those uh, labs that are doing so. And um, for this particular incident in Oregon, uh, the commission, the Lear Commission was, they had proposed a 34 day license suspension for Cura. And because this would have affected, it would have affected the acquisition, which was closing. Um, instead, they simply issued them a $10,000 dishonest conduct policy. So uh, I do understand that I'm sure this affects a number of jobs within Oregon. And, but if we look at $117 million in revenue in 2018, that $10,000 dishonest conduct uh, uh, fine doesn't seem very strong. In any case, um, uh, when I looked a little bit deeper, um, the information I found said simply that they had botanically derived terpenes which means it could have come from uh, flowers, uh, fruit, from a source um, other than cannabis, I think is the indication, and then medium chain triglycerides. So we don't want to smoke or vape MCT oil. MCT oil is a great carrier for oral ingestion for what we call tinctures that are orally administered oils. And um, it can help to bring cannabis to the brain and flush the blood brain barrier wall, according to some of the scientific research reports that I've seen. So it can be great, but we don't want to vape it. Um, and uh, the company stated that there was a disconnect between what's happening in production and what's happening in marketing. So let us let us all take a lesson from that in terms of our production.
Um, and then I also want to just share with you, you know, the um, if if you are concerned about your vaporizer cartridge, if it's liquid at room temperature, I can tell you that it has some additives in it, so you'd want to avoid that. However, brands or companies, excuse me, uh, are or not even companies, you know, I guess individuals in the illicit market are also using what is a product called honey cut. They cut the oil with that. It does not affect the viscosity. They call it a diluent. It does not affect the viscosity. So it could still be solid at room temperature and requiring heat to become more liquid because of this cutting agent, which is intended to reduce overhead costs. Um, I, my message is to everybody, let's just use cannabis or botanical terpenes, um, but no additional additives. We don't know how they're gonna affect our health. And we wanna make sure that we're staying as close to source as possible. Mother nature be our guide. South Dakota will be potentially the, they will be the first state to have uh, both medical marijuana and adult use legalization initiative on the ballot at the same time. Uh, this is exciting news. Uh, it also reminds me that if you've been in the industry for a minute, um, going back to 2014, 2015, the Department of Justice issued the Wilkinson Memo, which authorized tribes in the United States to cultivate cannabis. Now, the Santee Sioux tribe in South Dakota took initiative and they uh, started working on what would be a cannabis resort. I was very excited about this news. Uh, I'm personally invested in cannabis tourism with experiential events, etc. I believe that this is a great avenue for our industry. And I love the idea of the tribes having another, another revenue source. Um, the casinos uh, are not great. That's a dying industry, unfortunately. People aren't really gambling anymore. And a lot of tribes are not positioned on property that is attractive to a lot of traffic. So they really don't have the ability to garner income from a casino. Whereas a cannabis resort is definitely a destination location. And at this stage in the game with our industry, people would absolutely be interested to participate in that. Um, I myself have been to a number of uh, cannabis retreats and even produced cannabis retreats within the industry. Uh, so I, 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 it's a great experience and it's a wonderful opportunity to integrate health and education with uh, cannabis or CBD products. Now, um, this is the official statement from the South Dakota Attorney General, Marty Jackley at the time. He said, a marijuana resort is a violation of both federal and South Dakota law that would further create public health and safety issues across our state. So we will be looking to the current Attorney General, Jason Robinsborg, to see you know how he wants to direct this. But uh, overall, the climate for tribal cannabis has not been warm and friendly. In the state of California, the regulations stated specifically that tribes must renounce their sovereignty to be a part of the, the uh, legal industry. Washington, however, uh, years prior had established PACs. Um, they simply wanted parity in terms of what people would pay at the register for uh, the uh, products in, in the uh, state licensed retailers and uh, as they would at the um, tribal entity so that there's parity there's not a discount for going to the tribes for cannabis over the state there's no loss to the state it makes sense for everybody and those uh the additional revenue goes to the tribes when people purchase from those retailers so we have a model um i would say uh keep your eye out for developments and if you can let's let's support let's support our indigenous peoples with uh, new revenue streams and uh, support them in being a part of what is the fastest growing industry of our day. Compassionate use. So uh, in California, the regulations restricted compassionate use programs. You know, we started out legal cannabis in California with collectives and the aim was to support patients. But uh, unfortunately, things got a little bit lost in the mix. And uh, now after two years of work, the Dennis Perone and Brownie Mary Act SB 34 is going to allow uh, licensees within California to donate cannabis to medical patients. That's cultivators or retailers. Uh, if you're a business that's interested in participating in that, then you should go ahead and contact your retailers and see if this is possible. Now, it does have to go through track and trace supply chain and um, the metric system. 
According to SB 34, the um, regulators have until March 1st, 2020 to update the system and accommodate with the new law. But at this point, Cal Cannabis has not issued a statement to my knowledge about when that will happen. However, uh, let's celebrate anything we can do to support cannabis patients. It's extremely expensive to purchase cannabis. And if you have a critical illness, there's no health insurance that's gonna subsidize that. So anything we can do to support patients in having safe access to clean quality medicine that will bring them healing is outstanding. So great work to everybody working on SB 34. We appreciate you. Uh, one of the largest companies in cannabis within the United States is called Cresco Labs, and uh, this is noteworthy. Their facility in uh, Joliet, Illinois, the workers there have voted to join United Food and Commercial Workers Local 888, uh, 881 chapter. Uh, Cresco is one to watch. They have facilities for cultivation around the country, multiple retailers, as well as multiple brands. The uh, California excise tax markup rate has increased. Uh, this happens periodically. The purpose of the markup is to have the actual tax match the 15% gross receipts rate approved by voters with Prop 64. It went from 60 to 80% January 1st. And then um, California BCC metric deadline is Janu was January 6th, 2020. If you're not already set up, you will be sus subject to license uh, suspension. And uh, there's no more external transfer, transfers. Um, temporary licenses have been phased out. So this isn't big news, but I'm just including it in case. HR 5587, uh, Representative Colin Peterson, he's the chairman of the House Ag Committee. He introduced HR 5587 and it has bipartisan support. This bill would amend the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act by outlining an exemption for hemp-derived CBD, and this is to address uh, the possibility of CBD being included in dietary supplements under the Federal Drug and Cosmetic Act. Now, uh, this could be good or bad. Um, it will likely be good for consumers because it'll bring in some more uh, testing and, and clarity in terms of the market. But for smaller companies that are launching products, um, it does mean that there could be some additional obstacles in the road ahead. Um, let's stay tuned. Uh, I am personally surprised about how quickly this is happening. When uh, Stevia was, um, was restricted from the dietary supplements, uh, that went on for a long time. You know, that's really the sugar lobby. But now uh, the farmers have really come through and they want new crops. So um, the, they, along with the uh, huge nutraceutical market, uh, many of the players that are involved with this are invested in nutraceuticals. So um, they're excited about this for that reason. Assembly Bill 1948. This was presented by Assemblyman Rob Bonta, who does great work. Thank you, Mr. Bonta. We also have Cooley, Jen Sawyer, and Lackey. This is a bill to support uh, lower taxes for California licensed businesses, and it has bipartisan support. Wonderful. Uh, Bonta said the AB 1948 has a strong tailwind behind it. Our state treasurer in California, Fiona Ma, is supporting this uh, legislation. So here we go. Anything we can do to, to reduce the tax burden on uh, any kind of cannabis licensed businesses is great. Um, this is how we're getting our medicine out to the people, but uh, hopefully there's a threshold because it's very difficult to overcome these obstacles. There was a data breach, apparently. Uh, I looked a little further into this report. This company uh, is called VPN Mentor, and it looks like they uh, are investigating data breaches. They found a data packet um, that was uh, not secure, I believe on the Amazon server for the company that does point of sale called TH Suite. And uh, TH Suite has uh, accounts in multiple states. They, uh, they were storing this data, which contained uh, um, a photo identification along with medical records. If you are a company that is using TH Suite for your point of sale system, then uh, we recommend that you get in touch with authorities because this could be a violation of the HIPAA regulations. Um, it's not known if this data was actually, um, you know, 
jeopardized or if there was um, uh, any phishing or attacks that happened as a result or that uh, actually were able to access this data, but it's something to be aware of. Um, if you have a cannabis website, very often you're under attack. Uh, even in my social media, I get all sorts of inquiries that are not uh, suitable. <laughs> so uh, we are a little bit vulnerable in the cannabis industry for whatever reason, even though we're trying to do good work in the world. <laughs> so that's something to be aware of. Uh, upcoming event. So this is the moment you've been waiting for. Our next White Buffalo event. We will be producing our second iteration of the House of Jane. We've, we're securing a mansion in uh, Palm Springs where we will host our Women Wednesday Happy Hour. This is an event uh, produced by Women Empowered in Cannabis, a network of 8,500 women in cannabis and CBD and the supply chain along with Tokativity, uh, between Tokativity and Women Empowered in Cannabis, we have a network of 44,000 women represented at this event. Um, this is coinciding with Hall of Flowers, which will be occurring in Palm Springs, March 31st, April 1st. Our happy hour will be April 1st. If you are in the Palm Springs area and you wanna come out and meet other ladies within the industry, please do so. That's from 5 to 8 p.m. on April 1st, the location to be announced. And you can find out for more information by visiting whitebuffalocannabis.com forward slash events, which is where we list our events. Uh, we produce experiential B2B and B2C events. Uh, often you will uh, be able to purchase our White Buffalo Spirit products there as well. And uh, Conscious Cannabis, this podcast will be a sponsor for the event. Thank you so much for joining me, Courtney Freeman, your host for Conscious Cannabis. If I can support you in any way, please do get in touch. You can reach me at cannaproductconsulting.com or you can go to consciouscannabiz.com. And for those of you who are listening, I'll spell it out. Conscious Cannabiz, C-O-N-S-C-I-O-U-S-C-A-N-N-A-B-I-Z.com. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you at one of our events soon or uh, seeing you back here for this podcast.